Welcome to Know the Rules of the Game podcast. We are here with Kelly Amat, and we're going to be talking about the intelligent ocean management. Again, welcome to Know the Rules of the Game podcast, intelligent ocean management. I'm your host, Desiree Patno. I'm so happy to have Kelly on our podcast this, this morning because the fact is, is that we know so little of our ocean compared to Mars. Could you imagine knowing more about Mars, which is how many galaxies away or how many places away than we do about our own ocean that's in our backyard, right? So thank you, Kelly, for being on the podcast this morning. Oh, absolutely. And so exciting. We have some extra guests, too. This is the first time ever we have all these extra guests. So I'm so excited. So a little about myself real quick. Um, we are broadcast every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I am the founder and CEO of Women in Housing Real Estate Ecosystem, NAWRB. And also I run a real estate brokerage for uh, 30 years called Desiree Powder Enterprises. And also I am an advisor and investor for Amicus Brain for AI for aging population and the Chief Strategic Officer for Zulu Time. Plus, I also run a, I'm the publisher of NRB Magazine, an international platform to bring this information to you. So thank you again for all being on the uh, podcast this morning. Um, know the Rules of the Game was specifically put out there to really bring to the forefront rules that we don't know about. And this is one of the things that is so important to me is the ecosystem. If you think about it in high school and biology, we are all you know, putting the sludge in the water together, how it integrated and what's going on. Well, here we are going to have guests that are going to bring to you the work they're doing behind the scenes and that they're bringing out there to finding out to help the health of our water in our ocean specifically. Um, and it could not have come at a, a more important time if you think about what's going on in the world right now with the coronavirus and what's going out with all the different um, you know, systems that are being affected by how we transmit uh, um, diseases and things like that if you think about the water systems and the flies. So again, thank you very much. Um, and we're going to go ahead and talk about real quickly about Kelly, um, her background. I'm so honored to have met her a few years ago. Um, I met her when she was previously working for UPS. Uh, she has been there almost 30 years. Um, she ran the um, international, excuse me, the national um, platform for them as an internal account executive. She started back in 1991, and she was promoted to the area of sales manager in 1994. After that, she ran special several assignments throughout the country. She was promoted director of sales in 1998, and then she was transferred all the way up to the full ranks when she finally retired um, back in 2018 as the um, uh, the National Vice President of Corporate Inside Sales, which includes locations in Greenville, San Antonio, Phoenix, and had 1,200 people underneath her platform. It's a lot of people, Kelly. Yeah, so indeed, welcome. I, I, I hate when you say those dates, Desiree. That's like a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't give away your age too closely, right? Uh, but what, one, of the one of the things that I, when I originally met you um, that I was so honored to be part of, you took me to Wise Place, which was um, a, an organization that helps unaccompanied women in a homeless place. And when we were there, it really show, showed the value of not only yourself, but also what UPS did, the family, as you called it, the second family, and that, that infrastructure, what was out there. Um, and you have picked very purposefully different boards to be on and what that value brings. So as that, you had you know, joined the um, MARES and um, what you've brought in that is incredible. So we're so fortunate to have two additional guests um, from there, and that is Natasha ben uh, Benjamin and uh, Aaron O'Toole. So thank you all for being on the call, and uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, Kelly, and introduce your uh, two guests that you have. Oh, sure, sure. And let me just uh, take a step back for a minute. I, I had a fantastic career at UPS, and I love being the vice president of sales for them. Again, you mentioned over 30 years, and, and really, I've got about 35 years in transportation and logistics. So I, I really enjoyed that career. And uh, when it came to retire, as you mentioned, I took a look at some of the boards I've been on and I loved all of them. And a lot of them doing a lot of really good work you know, in the homeless area and with women, et cetera. But I realized I wanted to have a broad impact as well on some of our natural resources. And the one thing that I have always loved is the ocean. And as I started looking for how I could best impact that, I found Mare. And MARE stands for Marine Applied Research Exploration. 
And it's a phenomenal group of people that has taken time to really provide information and data on the health of our oceans and has been able to really move the needle and to assist states in moving forward with protecting that. So you mentioned I've got two great partners on the phone with me, um, Natasha Benjamin and Erin O'Toole. They are also working with Mare, and I want to go ahead and give them a moment to uh, introduce themselves. So why don't we start with Natasha? Natasha, you want to give a brief introduction for yourself? Thank you, Kelly. Uh, thrilled to be here with you guys to talk about the ocean. I am the Policy and Outreach Director at MARE and work on everything from science to policy to outreach in terms of explaining to the public what we're trying to do um, in creating a healthy ocean. And my background is in marine biology and marine policy and very excited to work with Mari and combine my background in science and policy so that we can create informed management of our oceans so that we can protect our oceans for future generations. Thank okay. you, Natasha. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, and Erin, how about you? Yes, um, hi, thank you. Thank you both so much for the opportunity to talk with you. Um, I am the Director of Development for Marine Research and Exploration, which means I get to work with all of our partners and those that want to support uh, the work that we do um, and our, that global vision of intelligent ocean management that we'll be talking about. Um, so that's, that's my role with the organization is to resource that vision. Great, thanks, Erin, I appreciate that. You know, Desiree, one of the things that I love is I love finding organizations that have a lot of strong women. And um, finding these two women right here has been really a, just a great perk of getting involved with the organization. And I must say that it's been very exciting for me because it's been a new area and it's an area that I'm learning more and more about. Uh, you started off with talking about how little we know about the oceans. And, and that's really true. I mean, we've got about 95% of our ocean unexplored at this time. And, you know, it's changing every day. Uh, you mentioned even what's going on with the coronavirus. Well, our oceans change every day too, just with what gets dumped into them and how healthy they are and where and how we can improve things to make them healthier. So I don't know if we want to start talking there, but um, maybe we want to start talking about just the importance of exploration. I would love to. I'd like to make a real quick um, step back for real quick. You have your information of where you were talking about the 90% of the ocean and the impact that's bringing to, together with that. I really, <clears throat> excuse me, believe that the leveraging of information when we talk about what we're doing from the infrastructure of the ocean itself. So if we could dive deep into that, how is that affecting our everyday life? I'd like to really talk about that in the framework of the 90% of, of the exploration go with it. So with that, let's go ahead and, and Kelly and, and bring that forward. So um, go for it. Oh, okay. Well, let me, let me kind of clarify this number, you know, again, when you think of 95% of the ocean being unexplored, that means there is an awful lot we don't know. And everything from when you think about climate change, and the acidification of the water and the impact, right, that that has on sea life. And then you think about mm -hmm. the amount of mm -hmm. oxygen the oceans really give. I mean, the oceans are responsible for a lot of our oxygen. So there are so many ways. And I know Mari's had a huge impact just with the data that we provided. I don't know, Natasha or Erin, if you guys want to comment on that as well. Sure, Kelly. Um, what, Mar what Mare does is collect information that we use to help manage our oceans. And one of the things that we've done here in California, where, where, we, where we're headquartered, is collect data on marine protected areas and some of these underwater parks to try to understand what's happening in the ocean, what the impacts are, and how we can protect the ocean. And we're really, it's just a drop in the bucket at, at this point. The ocean is enormous. It covers 71% of our planet. Some people think we shouldn't be calling it planet Earth, but planet ocean, uh, if, you, if you think about it. 
Um, and we are all connected to this, this ocean. Um, and we are, Mare is, is taking the first steps to try to understand what's happening in terms of, of fish and habitat and ecosystems and how climate change is impacting it, how fishing is impacting it. And, uh, and get that information and make that information available. That's really what we want to do so that we can make informed decisions. Yeah, that's, have two that's, things that's, yes, thank you, sorry. Um, do you have two things there that I really thought were very interesting, um, Natasha? One is climate change. If you think about the and Antarctica, they just had one of the biggest glaciers are, are multi, melting and coming apart. You have also the rising that they say if you continue the rate, it's going to go up four feet. Your ocean of 71% of the planet, you know, we can joke about it, it's actually going to be more increased because it's going to be higher. It's going to cover more that land's going to go underneath the water. Um, and, and that's into my uh, my feel is is that that's so important because we have climate uh, change in addition to what the ocean's doing and it's going to absorb all the contaminants that are on the ground are going to go back into the ocean not just from it being funneled into it but it's actually going to be a, the absorption rate's going to be much higher because it's going to automatically be under the water so and then you bring a second thing is is that i want i, I want to take a step back as the policy side you know, we can sit here and take so long to get something passed through Congress or passed through the state or passed through different, you know, environmental policies. But as, as a concerned citizen and someone who's bringing the information out there, we need to collectively know what those, that information is that we can do better. And that's why you are such a pivotal place to have this information that you're bringing from underneath the water, underneath the ground, as we used to say, um, out to the forefront. So thank you very much for doing that um, and bringing that information out there. And, and Kelly, I apologize. Um, go ahead. You were saying something. Well, well I, I Oh, go ahead. I think it's really interesting. We've had, you know, a long term relationship, for example, with a lot of the state organizations out here, um, such as California Fish and Wildlife. Right. And so what we do is we actually do work with them to get the data to assist in these marine protected areas. So if you think of national parks and all the national parks that we have, we really haven't done much to help our oceans clean themselves and to see what impact we can have if we set aside some areas and and honestly the data we have says we're you can have a lot of impact the ocean can literally come back can clean itself can get healthier if we protect it and um again i don't know if, if uh, natasha and aaron you want to guys want to comment on that as well but we've had huge impact is when in the areas that we've actually protected Yes, and I, I, um, this is Erin, and I would love to go back to that point you made about how that impacts the, um, like what that impact is on humanity, right? What, what, what does that mean to us? And one of the first points um, I think, Kelly, you made is that the ocean provides 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. Every second breath comes from the ocean. And when you look at what's happening on land with the Amazonian fires, with the fires in Australia, that are destroying the land-based oxygen production, that ocean, that our ocean's health, we're gonna need that ocean to be healthy. They're, that's our safety net. <laughs> so yep. it's <clears throat> just kind of bringing that back to, to why, the why, um, it's so important. And in terms of um, that, the, the critical ecosystems that we're working in, we work primarily on the continental shelf. So the, there's been a lot of, I think, citizen science and, uh, and eyewitnesses in the, at the diver depth of our ocean. We know a lot about the shallow depths of our ocean, but that um, below that diver depth, there's a lot of mystery. And that's where I think a, a lot of what, where the exploration becomes really critical to understand what's going on in those deeper depths that are below where the human can reach um, that are really tricky to reach. Yeah. So you bring, you bring up a very incredible point. Um, you talked about, you know, here we're discussing rule number one, exploration is critical and undervalued. Um, and I totally um, need to amplify this. You are a specialist in the, I believe it's 100 to 300 meter, if I'm correct, or yard um, underneath the ocean as the cameras that they go, because that's where we're not, as you just said, the diver depth versus then that, that second tier of the ocean. 
Yep, that's right. The meters. Yep, hundred to three hundred meters. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So that that is, you know, we we do a lot of exploration on the bottom of the ocean, right? Because of ships and everything else we want to go explore, the health of it, um, what's going on at the top. And this is very, if you think about it, it's kind of laughing real quickly. It's the middle part. You know, we talk about leadership that, you know, that uh, Kelly sits on the NDLC's leadership council is, is that that middle space. How do we get them from uh, going up to the ladder? You're doing the same thing in the ocean. How do you ask, how do you bring it through the entire ocean health, right? The entire leadership health, um, very parallel there. So can we have a little bit more information about that that 100 to 300 meter, um, even Natasha and Erin about that space and why it's so critical? Yeah, and you know I'm going to jump in just real quick. Um, you know we have different equipment for different levels. And I believe, okay. you know, doesn't the beagle, I think our, we have one called, we have different names and I'm just learning all the names, but batfish, hammerhead, um, a beagle that go to different depths. But um, again, I want to turn it over probably to Natasha or Aaron to talk about the specifics, but that 100 to 300 meters, the reason that's so critical is there's so much life there. And to your point, Desiree, we, we know there's a lot of life there, but we, no one's been able to do the studies until Mari has been doing them with our equipment. And, um, and that's a need that we have. We need more equipment and we need more capital to get more equipment. So, you know, we're going to talk about how people can get engaged. But um, Natasha, why don't you talk a little bit just about the equipment itself or Aaron, whomever, whichever one of you. Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to jump in on the equipment. Um, people might be wondering, yeah, how do we collect this data? How do we get down there? Uh, we use robotic submersibles, robotic technology uh, that ha are outfitted with cameras and sensors and still cameras and video cameras that collect all of this visual information. And then we take that visual information and we turn it into data. And as, as Kelly mentioned, we have a, a fleet of different vehicles that we use depending on um, the conditions and the environment and the depth. Our Beagle ROV, which is a remotely operated vehicle, can go actually to a thousand meters. It's rated to a wow. thousand meters, but luckily um, most of the fish, especially here off the coast of California, the bulk of the biomass where we see most of the fish is between about 100 to, I would say, 600 meters, actually. Um, and those are where the critically important fish live. These are the fish that people like to eat. And these are the fish that we're studying and trying to understand more about. Uh, so so that's, that our Beagle ROV is the main vehicle that we use to collect data. And then we've developed other technologies to uh, go into more shallow areas and, and use different boats depending on kind of the purpose of the project. And we collect a lot of uh, really good information that gives us a, a, a nice vivid picture of our ocean. We collect information about the temperature and the oxidization and the, um, we're able to collect samples. And just to, I think, illustrate that point of how, um, how much we still need to learn about our, our deep ocean, we found a new species of coral last year on one of our expeditions. Um, it's 20, it was 2019. It's been, who knew that we were still in the space where, um, where new species were, were able to be identified. Uh, and luckily we have the equipment that enables that kind of exploration and discovery. That is excellent. That is, that's positive news would be such a welcoming thing. Um, that is fantastic. And it just shows that life is still growing. It's, it's evolving to beauty right um and to highlight that and bring it out would be absolutely fantastic and i you know i'm you know we're based here in irvine as our headquarters and i am such a uh, a lover of plants and as kelly a lover of ocean i see all her beautiful pictures of sailing across the beautiful ocean um but the ideas and i used to raise hobie cats you know back in the day when they're you know hobie cats were the catamarans that you know i had four thousand was their number and we're talking back in the early 70s um, late 60s and so um, now I think there are several hundred thousand but the core is is that if you think about the oxygen level we go back to the uh, the 
oxygen in our plants, you know, the recycling of, of clean in the air, there are filters. You think about the ocean and it's filtering and we need it because it's applying 50% of the ocean. Um, one of the things is, is that exploration is critical, undervalued. undervalued. Do we know anything about how the ocean filters? You know, the water or, uh, provides us oxygen. Is there any little tidbit that might be helpful that, that people could take away from this call? Well, you know, I, I want to share a quote from our founder because I think um, it just, it, it really, it says it all. Our founder, his name is Dirk Rosen, and uh, he's done a ton of the work. And one of the quotes that he said was, the ocean, oceans are the lungs, the heart, and the thermostat of the planet. And I think that really says a lot because Aaron already mentioned, you know, every other breath, the oxygen you're breathing in, every other breath comes from the oxygen from the ocean. So if you think about the oceans being our lungs, our heart, and our thermostat, yeah, it's important that we make sure that they are managed intelligently. And, you know, Mari's done a great job because we've got 15 years of data. So we're going back to places and seeing, again, the impact. When we protect areas, they actually flourish. They come back. And um, I do want to kind of think, talk a little bit about, you know, just the amount of people that depend on the ocean for protein, their primary source of protein. I think over 3 billion people depend on the ocean for, you know, their primary source of food. And it's really important as consumers, then this would be the second point, right? Consumers have yes. a lot of power to impact ocean health. I mean, they need to understand what's going on with the oceans in order to ensure that we um, have a secure food supply in the future. It's so pivotal when you pivotal when you look at what's going on with above the land, right? If those who are eating, you know, whether they're you know uh, vegans or don't want to eat with you know any kind of meat or byproduct or anything like that, especially with all the you know the chemicals and everything that are above ground. If you think about the water and and the chemicals that are being ingested into the ocean, and and you talk about three billion that are supplying their protein, which is our own body, the only or what you eat, right? And breathe. Mm -hmm. um, and your founder was so incredible in his thought process of saying that, you know, lungs, the heart and the thermostat, it truly is. And, and the fact that you're saying after 15 years, it's been able to take care of itself and, 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 and rejuvenate itself. Same thing is, is that, you know, you have your own body, you know, you can go through all these illnesses and have all these problems. But if you start correcting what you eat and what you put into your body, if you exercise and take care of yourself, yeah, we're getting older. But if you apply that stuff, you can make yourself better than you were when you were younger. And that's right. what you're saying with the ocean here. Um, you're applying yourself to really integrate, to say, let's understand, let's get it better. And we all apply it. We can make our ocean even better, which will make our land healthier, which will make our oxygen healthier, which will help us, especially when we're all having more, health, you know, lung condition problems, uh, just because of the uh, the problems that we're having through so many different chemicals that are being used. So, um, yeah. Anything else on on rule number two? Here we got consumers have a lot of power to impact ocean health. What are some of the uh, key components that would be that we should all know and, and to be right book of business every day for us in that capacity. Well, well if, if I'm, if I may, I just want to step back because I think um, I, I, I just want to make a, a really um, kind of exciting point about um, what you were saying regarding the, um, the, the protein and the fish, the, the um, the food security when it comes to the ocean, marine protected areas are a, a really strong solution. Um, and we have, Mari has collected the data that illustrates how powerful a tool it is, um, but it takes time. So for instance, in one of our, um, one of the sites that we visit is, in the, is off the Channel Islands. And mm. there were, Natasha can actually, can I pass this to you? Because I think you do a better job of explaining the, the fish, um, the primary, the target fish populations that we were looking at and, and how the protected areas really helped, um, helped them flourish. Can I pass this to you? Sure. Um, I love talking about the Channel Islands. <laughs> one, <laughs> one of our favorite spots. Uh, the Channel Islands is a really unique place of biodiversity and was one of the first areas that California went ahead and implemented these, these protected areas, these blue underwater parks, as we call them. And um, this was in reaction to a number of things, but we knew we needed to put certain areas aside, kind of as a, as a 
as a safety net for, uh, to replenish the rest of the ocean as more demand um, in, increased for seafood products over the last 100 years, um, especially over the last 50, we've, we've seen decreases in fish populations and we saw the need to put, put aside, um, put some in the bank, basically. And Mare was fortunate enough, that's, this is actually how we started, was in the Channel Islands. And we knew that they didn't know what was happening below scuba diver depth. So we took our robotic technology, we went to the Channel Islands and we collected information uh, when the marine protected areas were first implemented. And then we were able to track them over the last 15 plus years. And what we found was pretty remarkable. We saw that inside these protected areas, we saw an increase of over 250% of some of our critical commercially important fish here in California. And not only an inc that much increase inside these protected areas, but we were also seeing similar increases outside, meaning the MPAs, the marine protected areas, the marine reserves were working and fish don't stay in lines and boundaries in the ocean and we were having <laughs> spillover effects. So when you protect species in one spot, and fish, they don't stay in those lines and they move and they replenish other areas. And this was very exciting news um, for the whole state in terms of what these protections can do, how we can replenish our stocks. Um, but again, marine protected areas is one tool in the toolbox uh, because it doesn't help us and protect us against other impacts in the ocean, such as pollution, plastic, ocean temperatures rising, chemistry in our oceans changing, that th these protections can't protect against those things. So this is one of many tools that we need to think about. And you know, I, Desiree, um, I, I would love to. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Erin. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to, um, to, to follow up on the original ask, um, the original question about what consume, what, what we can, can do regarding that purchasing power and the choices that we have um, and something that I mean the fisher the, the fishing industry is going to respond to the demand if if you know if people if there's more awareness around what um, what those more vulnerable fish populations were you know what fish um, what what fish to buy what fish not to buy where to buy them that information's out there um, there are lots of uh, great apps on your phone, the seafood watch. Um, but that makes a huge difference because the, the fishing industry will respond to those kinds of demands, um, knowing what fish is local and what fish is, um, is, is uh, selected, you know, or, or fished sustainably with uh, responsible fishing practices. That's really important um, to the, the health and, and sustainability of our ocean. And again, the industry will respond if consumers are educated and informed. Well, and you can tell Desiree how excited we all get because we're all trying to jump in here. But what I would say- <laughs> <laughs> what All I good, all good. I know is, you know, just the whole, the focus on plastics that has been occurring, I think is exciting and it's about time, right? Like, like plastic straws. I think everybody understands what happens when that gets into the ocean and the, the sea life sees them and ingests them. I mean, it's just, it's awful. It's killing our sea life. And I was down at an event down here in um, Southern California just this weekend and they, uh, they helped uh, mammals, sea mammals live and they rescued them and they were showing the amount of plastic that these animals are ingesting. So, you know, if we can cut down on the plastic, you know, reusable grocery bags, we've done that, right? Getting rid of plastic straws, all those things, they matter. Great they all point. Matter. Yeah, they, it, you know, I saw an article where they had this whale that had 120, they, they had several years of it just in plastic and had like 125 pounds of plastic in its body. Um, and, you know, we had the big thing about, we remember where the um, Coke cans or the, you know, the can, the pop cans had the, um, the ties that were getting around the birds. Um, yep. And then, you know, you saw it where you had the, you know, the straw got stuck in the turtle. Um, and then you started going through and now they're starting to talk about how it's really getting in the ocean, but it's, they highlight the most extreme cases and they don't sit there and say that this is, you know, uh, a global epidemic or the volume is of going it. Um, and that's where I, I want to go back to the Channel Islands. 
Um, education is so important. When I was a child, um, you know, it, it cracks me up that I actually say I was at one time. But I, when, when I was young and going to uh, elementary school, we actually had a field trip to Channel Island. Oh. Um, and it was mandated of all of us in the elementary school to go to Channel Island. And we took a, um, you know, we went over there and we actually went and saw the marine life. It was, it was all about oceanography and what it was like to have this island and what it was like to have the protected waters and what it was like to have all the different things that are going with and being out with one in nature, we're going to call it. Um, and to hear what you just said, uh, Natasha, about the protected parks and that there is no boundary lines underneath the water and then it spreads. You know, it, it just, when things, good things happen, it's going to migrate. And that's the whole purpose of having, you know, these protected parks. But also the fact is, is that it shows this is good versus bad in the sense of this is, I shouldn't say bad, but this is what, you, if you take care of it versus if you don't take care of it. And having that comparison, you know, you go back to the matrix of what's working, what's not working. You know, we have so much data and so much overload that's going in society right now that, you know, we're, what do we do, what do we don't, our bandwidth. So having that information out there and protecting, and one of the things that I wanted to highlight real quickly, do not let me forget, I know this is a podcast, but the idea is, is that I know someone very high ranking within the um, um, forestry. And when Aaron, you mentioned about the forestry working with the ocean and, and, and oxygen production, why aren't we connecting those two organizations? And why aren't we connecting that impact? Because the sharing of the information, who you know, what you know, is why this this is all so important. So make sure I don't forget. But oh, on, on, on the value, go ahead. Uh, I, okay, I just, sorry, I just got to say, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Collaboration, there are so many great organizations out there, but you know, you can't work in isolation. And I think working together, we can have, we can have huge impact. And if I can throw one more thing out there, I'll just sh share, sure. as a mom, my own ignorance, you know, I love Mylar balloons for birthday parties. Love them. My kids had a whole bunch of them when we were growing up. And guess what? I was out on a whale watching boat and there was one in the ocean and I learned out, oh yeah, those are the worst possible thing because they attract the sea mammals because they shine and they sparkle like a fish mm -hmm. and, eat them. Mm -hmm. and I was like oh my gosh I've you know probably grown that industry just by myself with the amount of mylar balloons I bought through the years I had no idea so making sure that they're disposed of properly or maybe not you know going to something else is is important um so I didn't mean to interrupt you but you know you just you start thinking about all the ways there are little things we can do to just make it better well, you, you you know, it's not that you don't use it or shouldn't apply it. It's how do you, uh, you know, um, make sure that you dispose of it properly and it's not going to cause any further damage to the ecosystem that right. goes on. So, exactly. um, you know, and, and that's what's so important, you know, having the straws or recyclable plastic or make them still pretty and shiny, but make it to where it's recyclable. You know, yeah. those are the things and, and under, understanding and going with it. Um, so thank you on that. That is, is so important. So. Now that we've uh, discussed, you know, how consumers have a lot of power to impact ocean. Here, Kelly, you just highlighted knowing what kind of balloons you buy, what attracts the fish, how it's going to be sustainable. Does it decompose on its own or does it have to be um, biodegradable or does it go into a plant? You know, how, how does it affect if we burn those versus then compress it and put it into our landfills? Um, we talk about how the no boundaries underneath the ocean, you don't have a net underneath there, obviously that the impact of the health of the protected life. Um, I think it'd be very interesting to put out there, I'm sure there's some data out there, um, Natasha, that you might know about where all the protected marine parks are. So we could show you know, highlights of when people go and you have all these reports, oh, these have the best oceans, oh, these are doing these great works. If we were to correlate or you were to correlate with the, uh, the marine parks that are protected marine parks versus the quality of the ocean around them that people go visit, that would be very interesting, right? Well, absolutely. You know, I, I just want to throw in there, too, that, um, you know, we've done a lot of work in California, like we said, and we just got to do some work in Hawaii. We just opened up another state here that's concerned about their oceans. And there's so many reasons, too, that we haven't even talked about, Desiree, like, the impact on tourism, ecotourism, all those things that there mm -hmm, are even mm -hmm, international mm -hmm. areas that are looking to establish marine protected areas for all the reasons we've already talked about. Um, so I, yeah, it's, it's an exciting time and it's really a crossroads. I mean, I think we, we have the opportunity to, to turn it and that's what makes it exciting. 
Well, you have we have the you have the opportunity to have everyone help turn it and and be the forefront of that turning. That's what's so powerful is is that is we're the information that you're sharing right now, because it's not just something a year old, it's 15 years old. You have proven data to show that it's making an impact and we're throwing good money after good product that's going to actually keep you sustainable in life. Um, and I think that's what's so powerful that all this gets done. So excellent, excellent. So as we go through this, um, it's like you said, 90% of the big tuna species are gone. We didn't talk about that. 90% of the big tuna species are gone. My um, oldest son is a chef on a boat. In fact, one of the things he does is, is helps them fish. And this past month was the biggest month they had in the month of February for tuna. Um, he, the, the amount of fish they brought was ridiculous. I mean, they had to look like 150, 200 pounds each. I mean, the size was over the top. They were huge. They were the size of the people. Um, and so when you tell me 90% of the tuna life, when tuna is such a huge commodity, um, what happened over the years? Um, uh, Aaron, Natasha, or Kelly, either one of you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, you know, we've had uh, basically over the, you know, the, since the Industrial Revolution and our capacity to fish has increased tremendously over the last 50 years. We have more technology, we can go deeper, we can go further, we can go further offshore, we can collect more fish, and that has hammered the resource um, on a global sp scale, especially around some of our larger fish like tunas and sharks and swordfish um, that there's, a, there's high demand over. Uh, we've lost, as, as you said, 90% of some of those big, big species um, that are critical, not just uh, what, when we think of sashimi, you know, at a high-end restaurant, but think about all that tuna in a can that a lot mm -hmm. of people depend on for food, for protein, um, that's affordable. And uh, there's, a, there's a major question of what's going to happen um, to some of those fisheries. And this is where, again, marine protected areas come in. They're talking about creating very large marine protected areas in the, in the middle of the ocean to try to protect some of the, the areas where these fish migrate. And this is a huge dilemma for the ocean science community and the ocean conservation community. How do we create these marine protected areas? And then how do we enforce them? We can create large, you know, close large swaths of the ocean but if no one is out there enforcing it, does it really make a difference? And then that's a whole nother political will and government collaboration issue um, that, a, that a lot of countries are grappling with right now. I think, Natasha, almost, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, most scientists say we need 30% of the ocean protected. Is that a, the number that's kind of thrown out there? Yeah, that's what um, kind of internationally, globally, scientists have agreed on that we'd like, that we ideally, we want to close off 30% of our oceans to fishing by 2030. It's called the 30 by 30 initiative. And um, Hawaii, as an example, has really uh, taken, taken that idea and is moving forward. Um, and as Kelly mentioned, we are, we're very excited to be taking the lessons learned here in California and bring them to Hawaii. We're working with the state of Hawaii right now to develop um, an expedition to go collect some of that deeper water data that we can, that, that Mare has access to and help them inform their 30 by 30 process, help them inform their process of, of managing 30% of their waters because they're just like all coastal nations. Um, You know, I think more than anything, you know, they're they're really reliant on their oceans because the, all of their economy tourism. is relying on tourism. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, you and know, that, that's really, I, I mean, our, our next big point too, Desiree, is, you know, that the, the public and the state organizations need data and information so we can make good choices. I mean, 30% of the ocean, that's a huge amount of the ocean. And um as, as Natasha already mentioned, then how do you enforce it, even if you set it up, right? What, what do you do? Well, and there's that, that question of getting the information, which is where um, Mare has, uh, has this unique capability of going down to collect 
from the most rugged of terrains. Um, and you need all of it. You need the deep water and you need the shallow to see that connectivity, to see what's going on, get that really holistic perspective on how your, how those nearshore waters are doing. Um, if there's a decline, you know, if a fishery, um, if you were just, we were just using ahi as an example, um, if that fishery declines, that's, that has huge impact. Um, so, but there are steps that we can take now to help that that fishery recover to help um, to help make sure that that doesn't collapse or decline too rapidly. Um, but that recovery takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of information. You need that long-term monitoring. Our work is is it takes a long-term view. We're not looking in one year one year increments. We're looking at five to ten year increments. So let me do a parallel analysis. And thank you all for this, um, Kelly. For a for you know, introductions and being being doing this, and thank you for being all of you for being on the podcast. I really wanted to do a parallel for uh, I cannot say enough work of what you guys are doing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Is is that the parallel between women on boards, the women's leadership, and going up the ranks? You think about what you just talked about as far as the public need to know about you know the food and health. Here we are. We're going to, you look at the marine life of protection of growing to making sure you put these marine parks out there, but who's going to enforce it? You look at D&I, who's going to enforce it? We can look at government, we can look at collaboration, we can look at, you know, deliverables. But at the end of the day, we as a society have to go out there and actually implement and say, we care about our our workforce. We care about the women and the mothers. On the flip of the side, our ocean. We care about our fish supply. We care about having protein that's in the ocean and above on land. So to do that means that we all have to respect the ocean to have what we call a hub, we'll call it the marine park, to actually a protected marine park to grow our supply food chain. You know, the reason we have, in my opinion, is, is that you have, you know, um, uh, uh, ranches that grow the cow, you know, that have the cows and the pigs and the and everything else that are out there. You're you need to have an incubator of food. Well, if you place them into an, a natural environment of a farm, we're going to call it, versus then in the ocean where they can thrive wildly and be in their natural environment because the whole ecosystem is is betrayed. Then you we are growing healthier, better at the same time we're we're invigorating the ocean to be back to our our, our ecosystem of health. Right. So I think is one of the takeaways from this call um, podcast is, is to make sure that the, the information get out there. So can we have uh, proposed information about the marine parks and what that did to our our food supply chain, our, what we're anticipates going to be in the next five to 10 years if we don't allow these marine parks and we don't have our own citizens to police it? Because if the government doesn't police these marine parks, Citizens can go out there and understand if they if they see someone doing what shouldn't be done. I mean, think about phones, right? Our iPhones or our, our, our Androids that we're actually catching things that are going out that shouldn't be done. You bring it to the public and say, you know what? You should be fishing here. This is protected marine life that we're growing and incubating this so we can help the infrastructure, right? You know, you know Desiree, I think one of the first things, though, is, is really – getting and i hate to say this but the political will right to stand up for the oceans and to understand again just the impact on oxygen to breathe and just the impact so you know we are um we've had some great support from the state of california now hawaii and um, others other state governments are kind of jumping on board especially of course the coastal areas but i think mm -hmm. more than anything is is getting public awareness and public engagement and if i can if i can make a little pitch here for mare you absolutely know, we need some help. I mean, we need help with um, donations to to get more cameras out there, right? So we can do more expeditions, more expeditions, so we can get more people engaged and more volunteering and just more capital overall to utilize for these these expeditions. So um, I, w I certainly think that that's a big first step. And if the public does that and starts promoting and supporting, believe me, we've got we've got folks who can do the work. You know, we've got people that know how to do it, scientists, et cetera. Um, but again, Natasha and Erin, what are your thoughts? I mean, I think that's a big next step. It, it is. And I, I say that I believe there's a, um, a common kind of um, perception or 
uh, or misperception that organizations like ours rely on government funding and we do work with the government but of over 60 uh, almost 70 percent of our of our support comes from from the community um, and from ocean-minded people and I do know that people want to do something and take action and really now is the time to do that if we don't act now the alternative is is fairly devastating and I don't want to get doom and gloom but it is it's it is existential and we are we are part of that uh, of, as a solution to ocean health. Um, we do stand poised to be tremendous support, and for us to be able to go out and do more exploration uh, and this, this long term monitoring, not just in the state of California, but really to help other coastal communities like Hawaii, um, like some of the more vulnerable communities uh, across our ocean and other continents. Um, that's where, you know, people who really care deeply, no pun intended, about the ocean <laughs> can really come in to support us with, uh, with investment in time and treasure and talent. Um, and that's, I think, you know, if I could piggyback on, uh, on the call to action here, that's what I would really love, love to try to bring awareness to that need for time, talent, and treasure. Well, you, you, you amplified exactly the podcast. Know the Rules of the Game podcast for intelligent ocean management. To do and perform that requires extensive R&D, extensive equipment, extensive um, leverage. And to do that takes capital. Um, and the byproduct is not the second. It's a long game. And I believe that with the right collaboration of, of resources from, if you can't give, you can get. And that saying we all know in the nonprofit world is about leveraging who you know, what you know, and getting the information out there, hence Know the Rules of the Game podcast. So I would challenge everyone not only to share the podcast, listen to the podcast from it start to finish, but making sure that you get the information out the next time you go and you buy something or you look for something that you wanted to see what it impacts you today or tomorrow. Think about, you hear enough about the ecosystem of life changing, you know, earth changing, you know, climate control, you know, all the different things going on. But understand that. So in our final minutes of wrapping up here on this podcast, that are it's unbelievable. We could talk about this for days, obviously weeks and months and years, and we will continue because we need to get this done. Um, and, and because this is our livelihood of who we are as a, as a species to continue our oceans and keep in the health because it's such a huge pivotal um, place of our ecosystem. 71% here we are as a joke of the oceanography of, of the planet, right? We're got ocean planet versus earth planet um, or land planet. So with that being said, what can we all, what are two or three takeaways that we can immediately do that's going to make an impact for us? As a, as a normal concerned citizen, besides giving money, if what can we do as our, our, our everyday purchases that without highlighting a company, but what is the best practice? Well, again, first of all, I got to say, um, I want to just have people go to, you know, our website and take a look because there's so many different areas. I really want them to go to and, and do something in an area that they're interested in, right? So, for example, if they're in the state of California, there might be something that they're going to do that's different than if they're in the state of Minnesota. So go to www.maregroup.org and you'll see everything we're doing. And you'll probably be able to take some tips for where you live and do specifically something that's going to impact your area. Um, I already mentioned certainly donations. We, you know, we, we love that too, because again, we'll build more cameras. But Aaron and Natasha, how about you guys? Anything that you think someone could jump into quickly? Well, I think the two points I would make are to be curious, like you said, be curious, go to our website. We've got tons of great video that will take you down to the deep. You can see for yourself what, what we're trying to protect here. And secondly, to be aware, to know 
um, there are so many great resources and this information is available for the taking and just to know what your choices are. Um, and thirdly, to invest in innovation. There are wonderful, I mean, Kelly, you mentioned the Mylar balloons. There are so many wonderful substitutes for some of the things that you hear are being taken away. Plastic straws, so there are no plastic straws. So there's bamboo, there's silicon, there's, <laughs> there's right. lots of wonderful, mm -hmm. innovative Metal. solutions. Um, yep. So that's, mm -hmm, those are my three. Yep. And and last but not least, share this. Uh, mm -hmm. we, are, we, we hope that everyone can be an amplifier of, of this information about why we care about the ocean, why the ocean is so important, and what some uh, organizations are trying to do to solve some critical problems that are facing the ocean. So we ask everyone to, to please share uh, with, with your friends and family. Well, uh, so thankful for all that um, and for every one of you being on the, the podcast today. And I think that your, your website says it so beautifully. Explore, discover, protect. Understand you give these incredible videos online. So I have, if I hear you correctly, we all have permission to share the videos that are on your website to amplify this to get out to everyone we know, correct? Definitely. Absolutely. Okay. Secondly, is, is that where can we go? Where is the best place to follow you? Is it LinkedIn? Is it Facebook that we can take your information that you post in your elegant way that we can amplify it and share it through our masses? Is that through LinkedIn? Um, you can follow us on the social media channels. There are links on our website and you can find us okay. on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram under um, deep Mare, Deep M A R E, or Mare Group, M A R E Group. Excellent. And if someone would like to get, so Natasha does the uh, research um, and policy, and Aaron does the outreach. So everyone who would like to get a hold of Mare's um, directly to do, you know, collaboration research, uh, Aaron, you're the person, correct? You bet. All right, awesome. And then all the policymakers that we work with, with Editor B, um, we'll make sure that we put you in touch with Natasha and Kelly, with your vast 30 years in logistics, knowing everyone and anything that moves anywhere in the world. Um, <laughs> that is, I mean, let's be real here, uh, you know, UPS, you never heard them in the news because they were fantastic for all these years, right? Um, the brown truck that sits in the corner. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, it's always good to be unknown, but known. Um, but yeah, so we all have, in my opinion, a incredible task ahead of us because at the end of the day, having just fresh product, food, oxygen, water, land is so important. And we need to, as, as most of us are mothers, um, need to make sure that our children have a place that they can call home, whether it's above ground, below ground, in the air, it doesn't matter. Um, the world's evolving every day. You know, we, we have, you know, a lot of things on the platter. So, and, and there's so much that is, is asked of us every day on a bandwidth. So thank you all again for being on this call. I want to make sure that, remember, this is know, know the rules of the game for ocean intelligence. We want to make sure that the, the life that we bring, that we save, that we grow and we nurture, as you heard, after 15 years, they can reproduce and make it even healthier. Um, it's not too late. We all have to step up our game and be more cognizant of our choices and not just do it because we have to do it for the right reasons and, and also we can have uh, sheer enjoyment. Um, and I want to thank especially uh, Kelly Amant for being our host today and exposing us to Mari's in this great, incredible group that you have become part of the board. Um, and again, if you'd like to get a hold of Editor B um, and make sure you share the podcast, we're at nawrb.com forward slash podcast. You'll see all the great uh, products and services we have. We have several that are coming up. We had, we just had a community service to human trafficking. I could go down the list. So if you have a subject matter that you would like to bring um, that is incredible, that has three rules to the game, we want to have that out there. So um, Kelly, in closing it up, what are the three rules that we just discussed? The three rules are, again, remember that exploration of the oceans is critical. It's undervalued. That as a consumer, you have a lot of power to impact ocean health and the public needs data and information to make informed choices, and Mari can do that. So with that, again, let's all get our oceans healthier.
Excellent. Thank you all. Have a beautiful week. And again, stay true to life and keep it going. So thank you again for Know the Rules of the Game. I'm Desiree Patno, your host of Know the Rules of the Game podcast. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.